Amen. Thank you, Chris. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here for the next sermon in our series about being built strong individually, but most importantly, as a church. And we've gone through some various sermons so far uh, about leadership and humility and speaking encouraging words. And, And today we're going to be talking about one of the most important aspects of being built strong as a church and as a Christian, and that is dealing with discouragement. I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life where I am just simply, you get discouraged, you get downcast, you're, you're sad, and maybe that even leads into some form of, of depression, and you can't seem to pull yourself up out of the mud of what seems like a crumbling world around you. And we can look into different stories of the Bible when these men, these great men and women of God, entered moments of discouragement, and we can learn How did they deal with that? How did they walk through those moments of discouragement? What were some of the things that they did, and how can we learn and apply those things to us in our life? And I can't think of any better person to look to than this man called Elijah. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. That's going to be our primary context this morning for our scripture. But before we get there, let me give you a little background about Elijah. Right now, the nation of Israel is led by a king named Ahab, and he is married to a nightmare of a woman named Jezebel. Yes, he is. That's true. Jezebel is a monster. She is a horrible person. She's a really evil woman. She is trying to eradicate Yahweh, the Lord, our God, from the land. And so Ahab and Jezebel have partnered together, and they've erected these altars of worship for this god named Baal. Baal was a god of the Old Testament, and one of the most horrible things that Baal worshipers would do is that if their child was chosen, they would take their child on the altar of sacrifice. There would be this gigantic uh, bull or an owl, and he would have an open chamber in his chest, and they would roll the child down into this chamber that was lit up with a very hot fire, and they would burn their children alive. We're talking about newborn infants and worship of of Baal. And so that was just one of the very many horrible things that they would do under Old Testament worship. And so here you have this toxic culture of evil in Israel, and you got these few people who haven't yet bowed the knee to idol worship, and Elijah is one of those prophets. You've got another prophet named Obadiah, and you can actually read his, his writings as well in the Old Testament. But Elijah has planted his feet firmly on the word of God. He is standing up to King Ahab. He's standing up to Jezebel. He's standing up to the prophets of Baal and the people who are corrupted, and he is speaking for God. And so you can imagine what kind of culture this would be. It is not a happy place for a true worshiper of God. And Ahab had actually killed the majority of the prophets at this time. And so you've really only got two prophets left, Obadiah and Elijah. Now imagine that. Look at the people around this room and imagine being an American uh, citizen, a Christian, and there's only two of us left. All of you have been killed. What kind of psychological impact would that have on the people who are alive? It would be a really terrible thing, right? So try to put yourself in in that type of position and that type of mindset. The people who you love and you've served with have been murdered, and they're coming after you too. Jezebel and Ahab are ruling the land, and they don't want God to reign there. And so Elijah has this showdown, so to speak, with Ahab, right? He actually went to Ahab a few years later, and he stood in front of, in front of Ahab in the king's court, and Jezebel was probably there, and, and her servants. And Elijah spoke to him and said, I am going to pray, and it will not rain until I ask the Lord to do that. And so here we are three years later, and there is zero rain upon the land. Elijah's prayer worked. Elijah was showing Ahab that you are not in control. The Lord our God is in control. You might think you're in control, but God reigns. And so it's been three years since it's rained, and you can think about this, right? Ahab is like, I have got to find Elijah and kill this guy so we can get rain upon our land again. Because water is the wellspring of life. You've got no food. You've got no animals, right? They're having to go to different wells and things of that nature. I mean, you're talking about a really tough period. And so finally, Elijah comes out of hiding. Uh, They're wanting to put his head on a plate. 
And Elijah goes to Ahab, the man who wants to kill him, and he says, finally, let's do this. Let's have a showdown. You bring your prophets with you, and I will be there, and we will have this showdown between my God and your God. And so what they decide to do is they decide to build this altar and call fire down from heaven. And whichever God answered was the true Lord. And so the prophets of Baal, they are dancing and they're beating themselves and they built this altar and nothing happens. And you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 18. No fire, no answer, their altar stays intact. And Elijah's like, your God must be asleep. And he's laughing at him, he's making fun of him. 450 prophets of Baal to one prophet of Yahweh, the Lord our God. And so Elijah builds his altar, but Elijah takes it a step further. He builds this trench around his altar, and he brings gallons and gallons of water, and he soaks the altar, and it's completely drenched. I mean, it would be impossible for this thing to catch fire. And then Elijah prays to the Lord, and he calls down fire from heaven, and fire comes down, burns up the altar. And Elijah says, the Lord, our God, is God. Yahweh is God. And so he takes the 450 prophets of Baal before the people. And the people began to chant, the people of Israel, who've been duped by this false god, they began to chant, the Lord is God, Yahweh is God. And there is a revival that takes place. And it is a great victory. They kill the 450 prophets of Baal. Ahab tucks his tail between his legs, returns to Jezebel. And and then we find Elijah descends to Mount Carmel and basking in the victory of God. And I've got a picture for you of what his, what his view must have looked like being on top of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, if you know anything about Israelite geography, it sits right on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea at the top of Israel. And you can look out at one side of the mountain, you can see this beautiful valley, which, by the way, would not have had buildings and structures around it. But then you look out to the other side, and you can see this beautiful scenery of ocean, and the breeze coming on his face, and the Bible says he goes up there to pray, and he gets strengthened. It says the Lord uh, strengthened his loins. It girded his loins, because can you imagine the emotional and psychological and spiritual and physical drainage that would have taken place on his entire person, facing the man that wants to kill you, trying to burn an altar that has been saturated with water. I mean, we are talking about somebody who is completely, utterly, emotionally drained. Now let me tell you a little bit about Elijah before we actually get into the context of the scripture this morning. First of all, we're going to look at the caliber of Elijah's character. This is a really good man. He is a solid man of God. He is bold. I mean, to stand up before the king and tell him he's a sinner and he's wrong and he's a rebel before God, I mean, that that takes a lot of boldness to stand up for God. He's also courageous. He not only stands up to injustice, but he goes to those who are unjust themselves, and he says, let's have a showdown. Me versus you. My God versus your God. And he puts himself on trial here. He's also faithful and obedient. He does whatever the Lord has him do. He follows God wherever God tells him to go. He does whatever God tells him to do. He's also a miracle worker. I mean, we're talking about a man in the Old Testament who was able to multiply food by the power of God. He was able actually to take a boy who was dead, and he went and met this boy's mother, and he raised the boy back to life. And here's what this mother said of Elijah. She says, I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. So we're talking about a very powerful man of God. But here's the thing we often miss when we look at Old Testament characters like this. He's imperfect. Elijah is not Jesus the Christ. He is not the son of the living God. And so he has faults and he has failures just like the rest of us. And we find Elijah getting caught off guard in this moment in 1 Kings chapter 19, and his mind isn't strong. He isn't prepared for what's getting ready to happen. And so if you'll look at chapter 19, verse 1 with me, and so you can imagine this. 
Uh, Ahab tucks his tail between his legs and he returns to Jezebel. And Jezebel, I can just see her, you know, up in, up in the top temple, just waiting for her husband to return to give her good news of the victory. And so she's sitting up there and she can see the cloud of dust from the horses returning to the castle in Jerusalem. And so she rushes to the gates to meet her husband. And as he approaches her, you can just see it on her face. All of a sudden she's excited. She's passionate about being able to see her husband and hear how Elijah's been killed. She wants to see his head on that platter, and she sees the face of her husband, and her her facial expressions begin to change. It's almost as if wives, you know this, right? Just by looking at your husband sometimes, you can tell when you're going to get bad news. And so Ahab is probably scared out of his mind because he's married to a lunatic. Literally, she's, she is crazy, okay? Not saying that you wives are crazy. She's crazy. And so he rides up, and he says, honey, it's, it's not good news. We lost. And you can just feel almost the tension in the room. She just, in a fit of rage, probably throws things across the room. Her prophets have been killed and murdered. And and look at what it says here. It says in verse 1, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying this, So may the gods do to me even more. If I do not make your life as the life of the one of them by tomorrow about this time. She's like, Elijah, I'm going to get you. You can't do this to me. Who do you think you are? I am the queen of Israel and I am going to have the last word. You're going to be dead by tomorrow. And so look at what happens in verse 3. Look what happened. It says, and he was afraid. And he arose and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And look at what he does here. And he requested for himself that he might die. Elijah's on the run. I have a map for you that I want to show you. Mount Carmel is going to be up at the top right-hand corner. And so he actually sprints to Jezreel. Ahab goes before him. All of a sudden, it's getting ready to rain as Elijah's up on the mountain. He sees the storm clouds moving in. And so it serves as a metaphor that rain is coming back to the land of Israel with the victory of God. But Elijah, a storm is coming into your life as well. And so Elijah actually says, if you read the end of chapter 18, that Elijah took off running Ahab left on a chariot. Elijah ran so fast for so long, he actually beat uh, King Ahab back to Jezreel on his bare feet. And so he is absolutely exhausted by the time he gets this word from, from Jezebel that she is going to kill him. And so he is so afraid that, look, he travels all the way from Jezreel down to Beersheba. I mean, we are talking about a long, long travel, and he is emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, and I can just see him finding this tree, collapsing from complete exhaustion, and finally he cries out in verse verse 4, it is enough, God. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He's defeated. He's discouraged. He had this great victory of the Lord, and now... He is in the wilderness, alone, without friendship, and he's ready to die. He's kind of like Job. Job lost everything that he had. He was ready to die. Or Jonah. Jonah had to go preach to Nineveh, and he he collapsed under a tree, and he just said, God, just kill me. I can't live another day. I don't want to do this anymore. I've had enough. I quit. That's what he was saying here. Now, I'd like to reflect on this moment for us to be able to learn some, some important truths about how to deal with discouragement. I mean, if we're going to be built strong, we're not going to be able to prevent discouragement from happening in our lives and as a church. We need to be able to be prepared for how to walk through those moments of discouragement. And so we can actually look at Elijah's character in crisis. You see, the first problem that Elijah had was that he was ignorant of the enemy. He failed to understand and anticipate who was hunting him down. And so if I could focus on a key point, it would be simply this. The conqueror of Carmel becomes the coward of Jezreel. He doesn't really realize the depths 
of, of Jezebel and how really evil she is. And so he's caught off guard in this moment. If, if you could ever picture this, it's like the art of war, right? Have you ever read the art of, art of war before? It's a, it's a really cool book. I actually haven't read it yet, but it has a lot of really good reflections. Yeah, I know. And so every once in a while, I'll look up phrases, you know, about what the art of war would say about a certain tactic. You know, because you're in, you're in war, you're at warfare. And so being ignorant of the enemy, here's what, here's what the art of war says. Master Sun, he says this. He who exercises no forethought but makes light of his opponents is sure to be captured by them. If you don't think about your enemy, in other words, if you don't predict their movements, if you have failed to take into account who they really are, you are going to be captured. You're going to be caught off guard. And so Elijah had just humiliated his opponent. And you would think, I mean, let's, let's all be honest. If we saw fire come down from heaven right now and just consume the front part of the stage, and then 450 people of a false god were, were, were killed, and we saw that type of victory, and yet we were on the opposite side of the Lord, we would say, wow, um, I think I'm on the wrong side. Let me, let me step on this side. I don't really want that to happen to me. I must be in the wrong. And so Elijah's probably thinking about this. I mean, here was an amazing miracle. The Lord had won. He had the victory. But yet Jezebel was so deeply rooted in her commitment to falsehood that no amount of truth could overcome her, her, her position, her, her mindset, her thought. We cannot underestimate the ability and the attitude and the perseverance of our enemy. And so a question I would like to ask you is this. Who was hunting you? Who is chasing you down? One of my favorite movies is The Lord of the Rings, obviously. It was written by uh, Tolkien, who he was a, he was a Christian. Uh, Jesus was his Lord and Savior. And so he wrote this story, and one of the best parts is in the actual, um, it's actually the second book. And so you have this guy, he's this, you know, dark figure, you really don't know who he is. Uh, Strider is the name he goes by. And so the hobbits are on the run. You've got four hobbits, and they're running away because they're being hunted, specifically Frodo. Frodo is being hunted by these dark, demonic, evil, immaterial entities. And he's not really sure who they are yet. And so I've got a picture for you of Frodo and Strider in this room together. And so the hobbits are really scared, right? Because these, these guys that are hunting them down are really evil. And in the Fellowship of the Ring, which is the first book in the Lord of the Rings series, they're having this, this encounter with this Nazgul is what this evil character is called. And so Frodo meets this character, Strider, and, and here's what Strider says to Frodo. Are you frightened? He asks him this question. And Frodo says, yes. And then Strider replies with this, not nearly frightened enough, for I know what hunts you. I know what's coming after you, and you are not on guard nearly as much as what you should be. And if I could take that point and share it with you, and impute that to you, to where you are Frodo, and this Nazgul that is hunting after you is a thousand times more powerful and terrifying and vengeful than Jezebel or an evil character in the Lord of the Rings. That is what is hunting each and every single person down in this room. And his name is Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Be sober of spirit. Be in your right mind. Have this art of the war strategy here, he says. Be on alert, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is on attack, and he changed his tactics. I mean, what better way to beat you in a battle than to convince you that your adversary is actually not there? That Satan is just this little devil that prounces around with a tail and some horn on his legs, and he's just this fictional, mystical character that you really don't need to know about. I mean, after all, we don't see demonic possession today, right? We don't see the things that happen in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, right? Is Satan really there? Is he really trying to get me? And the answer is yes. And if you don't think that Satan is on the attack to destroy you and your Christianity and your family, you have already lost. You've already lost. And so we've got to be on guard. We've got to have a sober mind. We've got to be alert. Revelation pictures the battle like this. In chapter 12, verse 17 of the book of Revelation, 
It talks about Satan being thrown down from heaven after the ascension of Christ. He was banished from heaven. He can no longer stand before God and accuse the brethren. And and look at what happens here. He's pictured as this dragon. And it says, so the dragon was enraged with the woman. This is Jesus. And went off to make war with what? Or with whom? Her children. Who do what? Keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Who are, who are they? Who, who's the children of the woman in this story? It's you. It's me. It's the church. He is enraged because he knows he lost the big war. And so now his objective is to isolate you and confine you and attack you to get you to fail in two avenues. From the testimony of Jesus, if he can disconnect you from the word of God, and from the obedience of Jesus, if he can disconnect you from obeying the Lord. And so you are in a war. Elijah's first mistake was that he was ignorant of the enemy. He was not able to step back from the picture and see that Jezebel was too evil to to overcome. She was too evil to win over. And so he let his guard down. And so church, I want to encourage you this morning, don't let your guard down. I can't tell you how many people I've seen come up and be baptized into Christ and dedicate themselves to the Lord, but they failed to take into account the enemy. They failed to realize and understand the moment you become a Christian is the moment you're going to be attacked the most. It's when life gets the most challenging, not the the most easy. And so if we are ever going to adequately deal with discouragement personally and as a church, we must encourage one another to do this. Recognize the enemy. Recognize the enemy. That's what we have to do. Encourage one another. Hey, I am not your enemy here. We are on the same side. We may disagree about the style of music or the color of the carpet or the project that we have to outreach the community. There may be things that we disagree with in the church, but I am not your enemy. We are not on opposing sides here. We're on the same side, the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you go through life, your husband and your wife, they are not your enemy. Your children, your parents, they're not your enemy. Your brothers and sisters in the Lord, are not your enemy. The church down the road is not your enemy. And so we have to go through life understanding and recognizing who the enemy is in our life and for the church. And so the ultimate goal of Satan is to ruin your marriages, to wreck your relationships, to wreak havoc with your relationship with Christ. His ultimate goal is to prevent you from obeying the commandments of the Lord. He'll make you too busy to read the Bible, too worried to rest in prayer, Too materialistic that you will actually sacrifice giving back to God for the sake of gain in your own life. Do you see how crazy that is? To think that we could actually turn our backs against each other and the Lord because of our own ignorance. And I have been there, and every single person in this room I know has been there. We get distracted. We get caught off guard. We get too focused on one thing. Peter goes on in 1 Peter 5, verse 9 to say this. Resist Satan, resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings as you are. Do you want to be reminded and remember that you have an enemy and his his name is Satan? Look at what's going on in the world around you, Peter says, and we can surely know that. Look at the Middle East. Look at what your brothers and sisters are suffering across the world, and you can remember who the true enemy is. And finally, Peter wraps up in verse 10. When you stand firm in the faith and you look at what other people are going through, the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong. And so Elijah was not only ignorant of the enemy, He failed to take into account and to practice standing firm, being bold, suffering a little while, knowing that God would restore his strength. And so the second issue that Elijah had was not only ignorance of enemy, but he was isolated and alone. He says, I can do this by myself. And look at what the text says. He was afraid in verse 3. And where did he run? To Beersheba. And what did he do once he got to Beersheba, it says? And he left his servant there. 
I cannot tell you how dangerous life can get for you with discouragement when you are isolated and alone and disconnected from the Christian community. If all you do is show up on Sunday morning and that's the only fellowship you have for, for, for the Lord's church, you are already on quicksand. You're, you're in dangerous territory. You've got to get connected to a life group a Bible class on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. You've got to fellowship with Christians. The greatest discouragement tool of Satan is to isolate you and to get you alone. And that's exactly what happened to Elijah. I mean, think about this. How many marriages are destroyed because one spouse is isolated from another? When conflict happens, they split apart rather than coming together. How many youth leave the Lord's church because they get isolated? They feel like they don't have a voice in the church. They feel like their opinions don't matter. You go off and do your youth thing, and big church will be here, and we'll make sure that the adults are taken care of. It happens. Our youth leave the church because they feel like they're not cared for. They feel like they don't have a community. How many people leave the church because they feel like they're on their own? They're not connected. You see, isolation in the church can come in two forms. We can fail as a church to cultivate community, where everyone matters and everyone is connected, but we can also fail as individuals by saying, you know what, I'm just not gonna do it. So there's a mutual responsibility here. It's not the church's fault that you're isolated and disconnected. It can be. We also have a personal responsibility to be connected with each other. And so if you can think of it like this, discouragement and isolation are Siamese twins. They go together. When you're discouraged and you retreat to be alone, disaster strikes. You'll fail, you'll fall, you'll run, and you'll flee just like Elijah. And so the greatest tool of Satan is isolation. He wants to discourage you and make sure that you're alone. And so if we as a church are going to adequately deal with discouragement, we've got to do this. Relentlessly keep the Lord's Day bare minimum. You have got to come to church every single Lord's Day. There's this really weird statistic in America right now where most people think if you are a solid Christian, that means you go to church two out of the four to five times a month. Two. That is not what it means to be a covenant-keeping believer. You have got to keep the Lord's Day every single Sunday, no excuses, no matter what, because the church is your lifeline. And I I, I read a, a minister's post like this. How many of you know the last 99 meals that you ate? Think about it. I had donuts last night. I had three donuts last night. <laughs> Straight up gluttony, for, for real, that's honestly. I had donuts last night, three of them. I mean, that's, that's a disgrace, right? But how many of you know the last 99 meals that, that you've had? But you're what? You're alive. You're still here. How many of you know the last nine sermons that I preached? How many of you know the last three sermons that I've preached? Probably like, I have no idea what Rick said 30 minutes ago. (laughs) Right? It's human nature. But here's the deal. It keeps you alive. Right? Just like eating meals keeps you alive. Sometimes you can't memorize and remember and know all of those sermons that were preached long ago. But they have been sustaining meals throughout our life. And that's the same way it is with the church. The Hebrews says this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We have got to say, look, don't disconnect yourself from the body. Keep the Lord's covenant. Be in church. Be involved in church life. Be connected with a group of people because discouragement when you're isolated is almost impossible to beat. Number three, Look at what else Elijah is going on here. He is exhausted. Think about what he's been through. And for the sake of time, we're not going to recap. But he's sprinted a marathon. He's being hunted to be killed, right? He's just had this showdown with the prophets of Baal. And he is utterly drained. And if I could share this with you, church, it would be this. You are most susceptible to an attack when you're alone and you are exhausted. When you're burnt out. When you've had all you can take. When you are personally drained. It's like, I think about the most exhausted time in my life. I was when Piper was born. Waking up, you know, every two hours to make sure she's fed. I mean, it was utterly exhausting, right? And you parents know exactly what I'm talking about. Another exhausting time is doing a youth overnighter. I feel like I'm literally dying, okay? That's literally what youth overnighters are like. 
And so, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, when you are so tired, you are open to an attack of discouragement. You will be beaten down. You will want to give up. You will want to throw in the towel. That's what exhaustion does to us. And we're not going to read it, but it's so funny. Elijah, later on this passage, just to let you know, it's, you know, he doesn't lose. The Lord comes and restores him. He gives him food. <laughs> Elijah takes two naps. Not just one. He, he rested, he got up and ate, and then he rested again. That's, that's how exhausted he was in this moment. And so in this moment, it's so pathetic. It's so sad. You feel so bad for him. He's laying under this juniper tree. He's looking up to God, and he's saying, God, I am so tired. Just kill me. I don't want to do this anymore. I am no better than my father's. Just kill me. I'm done. He's, he's discouraged. So number three, if we are going to overcome discouragement, we have to remember to rest. We've got to remember to take time and rest. Go away for a weekend. Be at peace. Pray. Spend time every day resting. Psalm chapter 37 verse 7 says this, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Don't look at Jezebel, Elijah, and say, why is she still in power? God, you had the victory. I just give up. God, why haven't you removed that person from my work? I am so discouraged. I just, I can't do this anymore. God, why haven't you removed that person from my life? Why haven't you given me this victory? Why does it seem that everyone who doesn't follow you succeeds and I am losing? You see the danger of discouragement when you're exhausted? You don't see things as they truly are. And so Elijah's ready to die. He, he, he transfers from the man who stands before Ahab, preaching the word, being strong, to lying down under a juniper tree, ready to quit. And so if we are ever going to adequately deal with discouragement as a church, we got to recognize the enemy, relentlessly keep the Lord's day, remember to rest, and then fourth and finally, recommit yourself to the Lord. There's got to be a recommitment that takes place in your own life. God, I recognize my weaknesses, I recognize my failures, I know I've messed up, my strength is in you, I give my life back to you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says this, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You've got to keep your eyes focused, you've got to keep your gaze in the right direction, and sometimes you may take a few steps back, 